Hello, good morning, happy Sabbath. It's Prophet Six, family prophet to the angel of the church to the lay old sins. God bless you. Uh, we're going to get into the Sabbath school lesson. This is a Sabbath school lesson uh, video, and uh, the title of the lesson is you know, we've been studying revival and reformation in this study, and we're on lesson 10. And it's called Reformation, the willingness to grow and change, the willingness to grow and change. Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for another beautiful Sabbath day, another beautiful Sabbath morning. We ask, Lord, that as we as we go into your word, as we study this lesson, Lord, that the Laodicea, the angel of the church of Laodicea has put out. We ask, Lord, that you would quicken our mind, Lord, that we might see, put this lesson in its proper perspective and that we would fix any chinks or defects in the thinking and in the spirit of how this lesson was composed. Lord, we ask and pray for the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. We ask, Lord, that you would bear pressure not force, but pressure on the hearts and minds of the leadership, Lord, that they that some of them would repent. Because, Lord, we know that as a as a as an angel, as a corporate body, we know that lay at the sin church is doomed. But, Lord, we still ask, like Abraham, if there are 50 souls, if there are 50 and so we are willing, Lord, to conversate with you on behalf of the angel of the church of the land of sin and the candlestick as it is represented in Revelation chapter 1 verse 20. Bless us, Lord, as we go through your word. Thank you for another Sabbath. In these things we ask in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. Now. Okay, Reformation, the willingness to grow and change. Now, the first scripture I want to look at is John, 1 John 2, okay? 1 John chapter 2. And it reads this way. This is what's recorded there. 1 John chapter 2, 1 through 9. Oh, you know, I'm, I thank God so much, people, YouTube audience. That God has blessed me with, with eyes to see the kingdom. Ah, it's no way I could have got this through studying, going through Bible school, going to uh, uh, these, these Laodicean colleges. It's no way. Public school, private school, parochial school, Baptist school, Moody. It's no way I could have got this. No way. This is really a blessing. And, and I'm going to give you an example of it as we read 1 John 2, 1 through 9. Now, look at this. I want to show you some things that people can't see. The vast majority of not just uh, Laodiceans. And, and by the way, I'm a Laodicean prophet, okay? I'm a Laodicean prophet. It's nothing wrong with the place Laodicea. Is something wrong with the condition of the people that's in the Laodicea? That's the problem. Let's don't get it twisted. Now, look at this. My little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And he is the perpetuation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, let's look at this. Let's unpack this. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. You know who he's talking to? John is talking to here. He's talking to citizens of the kingdom. He's talking to an audience who is supposed to be born again, born of the spirit. OK, that's what they supposed to be. That's that is what they are supposed to be. All right. 
So let's get that. This is not talking about people that are not born again. I write unto you little children that you sin not. No, 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 no. He's talking about people who are in leadership positions. He's talking to people who are uh, uh, citizens of the kingdom as it relates to the laity. If any man, if any citizen of the kingdom, see, see, be, I can see kingdom here in whatever I read because I'm always seeking first the kingdom, especially when I'm reading the Bible. So my little children, and how do we know that these got to be people that's born again? Because Jesus said the children in Matthew chapter 13 in Luke 4 and in uh, Mark 4. Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke chapter, ooh, Luke 8. Jesus said that the children, the tares are the children of the kingdom. So John here is writing, my little children, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, my under the ever living spirit of prophecy of that day, this is what he wrote. My little children, these things write I unto you, that ye sin not. And if any man sin, now what is sin? Let's let's unpack this, y'all. Let's really get into this. Sin is the trans. See, because I focus on the kingdom. And I do just what Jesus commanded. Seek ye first the kingdom. And seek first the kingdom means seek exclusively only the kingdom. By default. Why? It's by default of the nature that is in you. Because you're born again. You're going to be seeking the kingdom. And that's what these Sabbath school lessons fail utterly in doing. My little children, these things I write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, what is sin? Yeah, sin is the transgression of the law. But the transgression of what laws? That govern the kingdom of God. Sin is the transgression of the law. The law of what? The law of love. But the, the law of love, what love? The law of love for the kingdom. And when you say the word kingdom, when I say the word kingdom, I mean the king and his domain, everything he rules over. This is not just about a place. It's about a person and his place that he has put us in and that he rules over. OK, so my little children, these things I write unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin. We have an, now look what he says. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The children, the tares do not have an advocate. The tares don't know God. They are the enemies of God. They are demons in human form and they are in high positions in every single denomination. Every single, especially Laodicea. Cream de la cream. So when I say, so children, and the ch how do we know that the children, the tares are not, this is not really talking about them. It's not because the tares are going to say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? And he's going to say, I never knew you as what? One of my children, as what? As one of the citizens of of my kingdom. I've never known you as that. Oh, I know who you are. You're John, you're Dick, you're Jane, you're Amy, you're, you're Bob, you're Todd. Oh, I know who you are. And that's what, well, that's why I'm saying that you don't know me. And I, I don't know you as one of the citizens of my kingdom. Don't that make more sense than Christ said, I never knew you. Doesn't, doesn't that make way more sense? I mean, if God is omniscient, he would have to know everything, but he don't know you as a citizen of his kingdom. That's what that means. And he is the propitiation for our sins. Whose who sin? For the children of the kingdom. The children of the kingdom that sin, guess what? There's propitiation for their sins only. Now, you, now let's don't get thrown off by the next phrase. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. 
He's the propitiation for anybody that is in the world and is born again. That's that's the only thing that this could mean. He's not the propitiation for the tares who are unrepentant, unreformed, and unrevived. He can't be. They are the children of Satan, and they are in the church to wreak havoc on every level in a very subtle way, it appears, today. So it says this, verse 3, and hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. Now, if the law is the transgression of the laws that govern his kingdom, and then in verse 3 it says, and hereby we do know that we know him. See? The, tear, the tares don't know God. The foolish virgins do not know God. Or they call him Lord. They don't know him as the Lord of the kingdom. They don't know him as that. They know him as a savior. They know him as a redeemer. But, but you know what? Now I have to regroup. They don't even know him as that. Because he hasn't saved them from worldly thinking that is really destructive to the building up of God's kingdom in their heart, in their relationship with their wives, their children, their friends, their enemies, in the way that they handle money. They don't know God. They don't know him. Go to church every Sabbath. They go to church every Sunday. They don't know God. They sing songs like, I love the Lord. He heard my cry and pity regrown. These people are lost. They are lost. They're singing in choirs. They're musicians. They're pastors. They're conference presidents. They're bishops, apostles, prophets, pastors. They don't know God. They don't know him. So look at this. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. What are the commandments? The commandments are the laws that govern his kingdom. See, John, when he wrote, wrote this, he had this in mind. Even as a tear living in the time of John and Jesus, at least the devils in the church had a kingdom mentality. They did. The tares today don't have a kingdom mentality. And by and large, most of the tares are in leadership positions and are the teachers of in every single denomination on earth. So if you can't see the kingdom of God, if you don't believe in the kingdom of God in all its prophetically revealed stages and in every, all the ages, guess what? You're not born again. It don't matter how much you think you love God. You are not born again. You are because you're not engaged in building up his kingdom in your thoughts, in your relationships. That's why so many Christians, you know, they're not born again. Look who they marry. They could marry a heathen, devil worshipers. I, I watch Christians do this. I watch Christians go marry, marry Muslims. They marry Mormons. They marry Catholic. They could marry anybody. Prostitutes. They have, a Christian will marry anybody that they like. And the thought of building the kingdom of God up with that person is the furthest thing from their mind. That's how you know they can't be born again. The first place you build the kingdom of God up, yes, is in your heart. But the next place you build it up is in your relationships with other people. Why would you marry somebody that you don't even introduce to the kingdom? Because you're not born again. You're not. He that saith, I know him, and keep if not his commandments. What are commandments? The laws that govern the kingdom is a liar. Is this giving more 
meaning to the scripture like you've never seen before? If it has, don't go silent. Leave a comment below. Leave a comment. I notice that people love watching your videos, but they don't leave comments. This is not church, y'all, where they expect for you to not to think, not to raise your hand, not to ask questions, not to challenge. Ask questions. We don't all believe the same thing. I get that. But ask questions. This is not a television show where you just, you know, you're just a consumer. Be a contributor. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his commandments is a liar. Now, look at that scripture now. He that saith, he knoweth him and keepeth not the laws that govern his kingdom. Where? In his heart, in the way that he thinks, in his relationship with his wife, in his relationship with his children, in the relationship of how he deals with money, in the way that he thinks about business, cleanliness, health. The Bible says he is a liar. Woo-wee. Woo. This is real present truth. They not teaching this like this. He that said, I know him. I know the king of the kingdom. And keepeth not the laws that govern his kingdom is a liar. And I gave you some real practical answers, examples of how. That would be true. So the vast majority of Christians, we're not Christians. We are liars. It don't say you're a Christian. It says you're a liar. Who's the father of lies? Satan. So this means that you are a demon in human form, parading yourself around in your mind and in public as a Christian. What better device of Satan can be used to deceive the soul than a person like that? Now, but whosoever keepeth my, his word, oh Lord Jesus, help us. I love this. But whoso keepeth his word, oh. Now, you know what I'm thinking about right here? I that It's like the prophetic has just hit me. It's like a prophetic download just hit me because I was studying this lesson early, early and the prophetic just just that prophetic gate just opened up that prophetic eye. And this is what the Lord showed me. Thus saith the Lord, but he so whoso keepeth his word or oh, what word in the beginning was the word. Ah, and the word was God and the word was with God. Now I'm going to jump here. I'm going to jump. And God said, let there be light. Oh, wait. You like that, don't you? In the beginning was a word and the word was God. And God said, let there be light. I know those two scriptures are not in the same place, but I'm just I'm, I'm just putting them in the juxtaposition to each other and in reverse order to show and prove a point. Now, watch this now. This first John 2, 1 through 9 ain't no joke. But whoso keepeth his word. In him, oh, what word? The word that said in the beginning was word. And that word said what? Let there be light. Let there be light where? In my kingdom. Oh, see, the reason why I think that way, the reason why the Holy Spirit gives me that revelation, because my eyes prophetic eye is open for the kingdom. So when I read Genesis chapter 1, 1 and 2, I don't just see God just making the earth. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. That's how that's how we've been taught to look at it. I look at him as building an addition onto his kingdom. That's what I see in Genesis chapter 1, 1. Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, all I see is the kingdom. Yeah, it's the earth, it's creation, it's all of that. But I see a kingdom. Why? Because God is a king. And he's putting an addition, just like you would put an addition onto your house. He's putting an addition on to his kingdom. Isn't that beautiful, y'all? Say amen. It's all right to say amen if you're watching the video. Say amen in text too. So come on, let's get interactive here. There's too many consumers here. 
We've been taught to consume. Sit down, shut up, put your money in the plate, get out of here and don't come back to next week. And when you come back, you better have some money or you're going to be cursed with a curse. No, that's not this. That's not this. This is the anointing. But whoso, whoso keepeth his word, oh, what word? The word that builds up the kingdom. Whosoever keepeth that word in his heart, meditate on your word. Day and light, remember uh, David over there in Psalms 1, shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, which bringeth forth its fruit in its seeds, and the leaves will not perish. And whatsoever, the, the Bible says, the Bible says, husband, love your wives as Christ has loved the church and cleansed it by the washing of the water by his word. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. And then when you go over to uh, Ezekiel chapter 47, we see that river just getting wider and deeper. But anyway, but whoso keepeth his word in him verily, oh God, oh Ooh, Lord Jesus, this is good here, what I'm about to give you. But whoso keepeth his word, what word? The word that actually builds up the kingdom. The word that galvanizes kingdom relationships. The word that galvanizes kingdom thinking on how to handle finances and maintaining of health of every organ to perfection and to the glory of God. Oh, boy, this is getting good. I'm not even into the lesson like I want to. Oh, <laughs> boy. I'm not even going through the lesson. I'm, I'm stuck here on First John 2. 1 through. See, don't y'all hear revival and reformation in everything that I'm saying? Do you see how this is not happening in any denomination on earth? None. These denominations are tools of Satan and of the government. That's all they are, y'all. Harlots. Prostitutes being pimped by the governments of the world. That's all they are. And the banking system. That's all they are. Harlots. But whosoever keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God revealed. Oh, Lord. Let, let me break this down to you. But whosoever keepeth the word that does what? Builds up the kingdom. Why do I keep going back to kingdom? Because the Bible says in the beginning was the word and the word was God. So it just that that first John, I mean, John chapter one is actually describing what's happening over in Genesis chapter one. And, and then God said in Genesis chapter one, let there be light. Let there be revelation. Let there be inspiration. To do what? Build up my kingdom. None of these denominations are building up the kingdom. None of them. Not, you can't name one denomination that's building up the kingdoms. All they're doing is having people, baptizing people, and making them, giving them the name Christian, but teaching them how to be slaves to the kingdoms of this world. In Jesus' name, they want them to be slaves to the kingdom of the world. So the, the devil has, Satan has stepped up his game. He wants us to be slaves of the world in the name of Jesus and with the power of the unholy ghost. But he's trying to pass the unholy ghost off as the holy ghost. Ain't that tricky, y'all? Isn't that tricky? Isn't that tricky? That is tricky, y'all. Isn't it satanic? And that's exactly what we've been doing. I don't care what denomination you in. I don't care if you're not an Adventist. I don't care if you're not keeping the Sabbath or even believe in it. All these denominations are the same religion. They really are. He that saith... He abideth in him ought himself also walk, even as he walked. Brethren, I write no new commandment unto you. Because there's nothing new under the sun as it relates to God's commandments and the laws that govern his kingdom. There's nothing new as it relates to that. Ecclesiastes 1.9, Ecclesiastes 3.15. I write no new commandment unto you. An old one, which ye have heard from the... What? Ah, I like this. Ah. 
This is proving what exactly what I'm saying is on point under the unction of the ever living spirit of prophecy. Look, I write no new commandment unto you, but an old one, which ye have had from the beginning. Ah, in the beginning, the earth was without form and void. And God said, let there be light. God said, I'm not giving new laws to govern my kingdom. I'm not. Those laws are going to be the same today, yesterday, and forever. The, the old commandment is the word that we what? Heard from the beginning. On what? That actually built the world and an addition onto his kingdom and gave man sovereignty and made him the viceroy of the planet, which was Adam. I write no new commandment to you on how the kingdom is going to operate and the laws that govern the kingdom. I, I don't do that. But an old commandment, which he had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word. Oh, Lord have mercy. It's a living word that actually builds up the kingdom of God and actually, by default, it destroys the kingdoms of the world. It has to, to be the kingdom of God. The old commandment is the word, which you have heard from the beginning. Again, a new commandment I write unto you, which, which things is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past. Ooh, don't this sound like Genesis chapter one in the beginning? Darkness moved upon the face of the earth and God said, don't this sound just like Genesis? Chapter one, if there's anybody out there that can hear Genesis chapter one, as I'm reading this, give me a thumbs up and, 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 and make a comment. Contribute. In the new commandment, I run into you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past and the light is now shining. He that, he that saith he is in the light and hath and hated his brother is in darkness even until now. Now, now I'm going to unpack this for you. He that said he is in the light. Okay. The light of what? The kingdom. He that saith he is in the light. He that saith he has inspiration on how to build up the kingdom. But he hates his brother. Oh, watch this now. He hates his brother who's building up the kingdom is in darkness even until now. Woo, you heard that? Hereby, we know we have passed from life to death when we love what? Love the brethren that do what? Build up the kingdom of God. See, you can't take me to no place in the Bible where I can't see the kingdom. That's all I look for. Because Jesus said in Luke chapter 12, verse 30, seek the kingdom of God. In Matthew 6, 33, he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. And actually in Luke 12, 29 and 30, it's basically saying the same thing. Don't look for all this other stuff. Seek the kingdom. First and only, and everything else you need to keep building the kingdom, it's going to be added unto you. No, not everything you need to ball and get rims and get a new BMW and a big house and get in. Not everything. God's not going to give you everything you need to be a slave to the bank by getting a, a huge home loan that is going to take 15 years to pay off. No, no, no. See, that's what we've been taught. And a lot of churches that say they don't believe the prosperity gospel, they're liars. You know they're liars because they're not building up no kingdom. That's why the church can be closed, closed all week long and open once a week. That's proof that we don't believe in building up the kingdom. If we really believe the building up the kingdom in our hearts, in our minds, in our relationship with the brethren in the church, it's no way the church could be closed 
or open once or twice a week. That's of Satan. Categorically, undoubtedly, undubably, that's of Satan. That whole practice. And you know, the vast majority of almost every denomination believes that. But anyway, ooh, wasn't that rich? Boy, I could go through that whole chapter, but we're going to digress there. Leave comments, leave comments. You know, people just consume, 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 you know, consume. Let's build a community of, of dialogue here. Sunday's lesson. Oh, 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 I, I dealt with that. I didn't even read the thing here. Memory text, but he gives more grace. Why does God, this is the memory text, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know, when Satan gave, uh, tempted Eve and Adam, he was basically offering them a whole nother kingdom, just like he was, was to Jesus in the wilderness. And he was telling them that you would be gods of that kingdom. So, but he gives more, gives more grace. What is grace? All these phrases that Christian use, they need to, oh, I want to tell you what grace is, y'all. Grace is the opportunity that God gives you to build up his kingdom. That's what grace is. It's unmerited favor to build up and work in his kingdom because you don't deserve it. Guess what we think grace is? It's just unmerited favor. Getting a new house, getting a new car, good job. That's what unmerited favor is for. That's what grace is for most people. You know, finding a beautiful wife, having beautiful children, living a comfy life, building up the kingdoms and the companies of this world, going into debt our whole lives, student loans, car loans, home loans, being slaves. We call that the blessing of God in every single denomination. That's how you know these denominations are of Satan. I don't care which one you pick. You could close your eyes and put a uh, put all their names on a wall and throw a dart. It wouldn't matter. They're all the same denomination with multiple different names, but in the same genre of faith. But he gives grace. That's what grace is, y'all. Grace is unmerited favor to build up his kingdom. Why do I keep doing Because Jesus says, seek the kingdom in Luke 12, 30. And in Luke, Matthew 6, 33. In Genesis chapter 1, the first thing we see God seeking is the kingdom on earth for man to be the viceroy over. That's what we see. When it says in the beginning in Genesis chapter 1, that means he's seeking first his kingdom. To dispel the darkness in his kingdom and bring light into his kingdom. The reason why I think like that, well, yeah, yeah, I'm a prophet, but that's the way the Holy Spirit gives it to me. I'm always looking for the kingdom. And because I'm always looking for the kingdom, I can see things that people could never see. They even wonder how I come to these type of conclusions that I come to. Because I know it can't build up no kingdom. It can't build up kingdom relationships. It can't build up kingdom marriages. The vast majority of marriages that are in every denomination are not kingdom marriages. They're not. They're marriages. They are, they're, they, they are marital arrangements to get together, to get in debt, build up the kingdoms of the world, build up the satanic denominations, which is all of them, and... Uh, and make our children slaves for multiple generations to the banking powers that be. That's, that's what the church is all about today. Nobody's free from debt. Matter of fact, we get in much debt. No matter how much money we get paid, we get in more debt. And that's how we know. That's an indicator right there. A litmus test that we are getting into more sin as a nation 
as believers, as a faith. Look at all this rich teaching, and I, I'm I'm not even on Sunday's lesson. Oh boy. Look at this. <laughs> oh, Holy Ghost, thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Before Pentecost, the disciples had significant spiritual needs. Their understanding of God's plan was beclouded. They failed to comprehend Jesus' mission. After they had, you know why? Because they were taught by the biblical research committee. They were taught by the people who write these Sabbath school lessons. <laughs> Satan in human form. Ellen G. White says in Desire of Ages, she said they were Satan in human form. The priesthood. Woo! The theologians, the scribes. And so Jesus had to come and unteach them all that stuff that amazing facts taught them, amazing discoveries, can what brother Cox and all these people, Nanny Shelton had to unteach all that stuff because it was of Satan and you couldn't build up a kingdom of grace, which Jesus came to establish after they had touched his divine grace. Christ's love broke their hearts. They experienced revival and reformation. A revival is simply an a reawakening of deeper spiritual longing. It is the intensifying of our spiritual desire as our hearts are drawn closer to God through the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Revival does not imply that we have no need. That It does not imply that we have had no previous experience, but it can mean that. Rather, it calls us to an experience that is deeper and richer. Reformation calls us to grow and change. But how can you change if you're not born again? These pastors don't care if you're born again or not. They don't care. They will put people in offices in any denomination. They don't care if you're sanctified. It appears and the reason why, because they are not sanctified. It appeals to us to move beyond the status quo spiritually. It invites us not just spiritually, literally. It invites us to reexamine our lives in the light of biblical values and to allow the Holy Spirit to empower us to make any changes necessary in order to live in obedience to God's will. This week we will study the lives of New Testament believers who experience growth and change in their spiritual experience. So let's go to Sunday's lesson. The grace to growth. The lives of the disciples show constant spiritual growth as they walked with Jesus. When Christ called his disciples, their attitude and actions certainly did not reflect the loveliness of his character. No wonder. Look who was teaching them all their life. Cradle roll, uh, youth Sabbath school, young adults, all that. Look who was teaching them. A whole bunch of priests and leaders that wasn't born again. Yeah, there's a cause and effect for everything. Not only that, they wasn't born again. Luke, read Luke 9, 51 through 56. Let's, let's look at 9, 51, 56. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village. Pardon me. And enter into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. Uh, just a moment. Wait for it. Wait for it. I'm trying to pull it over. Computer slow. Hmm. 
This is really slow. Sorry. My apologies. And no, I don't edit my videos. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and he sent messengers before his face and they went and entered to the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was not as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man has not come to destroy me with life, but to save them. And they went to another village. So these people did not receive them. And so um, they said, James and John, let's kill him. Now, remember, John is the disciple that Jesus loved. He had a temper. He wasn't just this effeminate guy laying on Jesus' breast. This guy must have been a warrior. I mean, James and John, I mean, the sons of thunder, let's kill them. <laughs> it's like, wow, that's deep. Why was they taught this? Why, why, why did they have this outlook? The, the priests taught them. The priests hated everybody that wasn't a Jew. They even hated Jews. I mean, look at the story of the Good Samaritan. It's a Jew lying down and the rabbis ignore him. And why do we think anything is different today? James and John had some serious character flaws. They were not prepared to represent Christ's love to the world. They were not qualified to proclaim a message of grace to others who had not ch changed their own lives. In spite of their serious defects of character, James and John longed to reveal Jesus. See, this is important right here. Their feet were headed in the right direction. They just not, they, the only problem with them, they had not progressed enough. That's all. They, their feet were headed in the way of the kingdom. They were following the king. I don't know where you think the king is going to take them. He's going to take them to the kingdom. <laughs> you, you know what I'm saying? He's going to take them into a deeper level of the kingdom, he, a, a deeper revelation of the kingdom, a deeper love for the kingdom. And in doing that, they're going to have more love. But people try to use this kind of stuff, like I'm saying right now, to put a stamp of approval on sin, even open sin. Well, you know, God, they God ain't finished with them yet. Yeah. But you know why they doing that? We need to deal with them. They long for transformation and reformation in their own lives. Growth and change are part of our Christian experience. Let's look at First uh, John chapter 2, 1 through 9. Oh, we already looked at that. So, yeah, we already looked at that. What do these verses reveal about the great changes that came over John during uh, the years after Jesus' death? What do they teach us about what it means to be a follower of Jesus? Well, I already explained that at the very beginning of this lesson, so I'm not going to comment on that. We're going to forge ahead because I spent a lot of time on that. It is so easy to get discouraged over our own spiritual growth. And I'm reading directly from this absolute lesson and making comments, especially as we truly want to have revival and reformation in our lives. When discouraged, when feeling as if you are a spiritual failure and that you are going to be lost, the promises can what promises can you claim that will show you why you must never give up? Let me tell you this. This is kind of dangerous here because this is a popular thinking in Christian mind. It is so easy to get discouraged. But I'm going to add some things to this, okay? I was reading directly, but I'm going to show It's so easy to get discouraged in our spiritual growth. And I'm going to, I'm adding this on when we don't. When we're not seeking first the kingdom. You see what I'm saying? Now, look how I'm reading this. It is so easy to get discouraged over our spiritual growth. 
when we are not seeking first the kingdom of God, especially as we truly want to, especially as we truly want to have revival and reformation in our lives, yet we are focused, we're bent on not seeking the kingdom of God. When discouraged about not seeking the kingdom of God, as Jesus commanded, when feeling as if you are a spiritual failure because you're not seeking the kingdom of God, and that you are going to be lost because you're not seeking the kingdom of God. What promises can you claim that will show you why you must never give up? I don't know. Maybe somebody can hear my spirit about what I'm trying to show. See, to me, this is too open ended. If you're not seeking first the kingdom of God, if you're not born again. There is no other course you can take. You really are taking the courses you're supposed to take to be lost. You, you're supposed to be discouraged. Because you have a form of godliness and denying the powers thereof. When discouraged, when feeling as if you are a spiritual failure. Because you have absolutely no desire to build up the kingdom in your marriage, in your heart in your relationship with your children, the way you handle finances and staying out of debt, taking care of your body. When you when feeling as if you are a spiritual failure and that you are going to be lost. Well, you are. If you're not seeking first the kingdom. What promises can you claim that will show you you why you must never give up. There's no promise. I'm The reason why I'm reading this this way, y'all, is because a lot of people have that type of mindset. They don't even know they're supposed to be seeking the kingdom. The ministers, hey, y'all, we, we've just looked at about, we went over five Sabbath school lessons. About four or five. And the word kingdom has come up none. 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 The only reason why you're hearing kingdom a lot on this video is because I'm I seek first the kingdom. And no doubt next week lesson, nothing about the kingdom. It's not the focus, y'all. OK, Monday's lesson, the power to choose. Change comes at the point of choice. Reformation occurs as we choose to yield to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and surrender our wills to God's will. God will never force or manipulate our will. He respects our freedom. His spirit. Now, let me let me read this. I'll read this another way. God. Change comes at the point of choice. Reformation occurs as we choose to yield to the convicting power of the Holy Spirit and surrender our will to God's will. God will never force or I'm adding something here. God will never force or manipulate our will to sin. Now, I added that to sin. He will respect our freedom to sin. You see how the word respect and freedom. They don't sound right. God is going to respect our freedom to sin. No, I don't think it's respect there. This is not a thing about respect. I think God is going to just grant us our the ability. It's not respect. I think respect is the wrong word because he respects our freedom to sin. No, there are many places in the Bible that God said he had no respect for Abel's offering. No respect for it. So now only thing God is going to respect is when we freely choose his will over ours. And if we don't choose his will, he's not going to respect the other one. 
I have a problem with that. God will never force or manipulate our will. I got just I'm just throwing this out. Nebuchadnezzar. Why did he make him an animal for seven years? That wasn't Nebuchadnezzar's will to be an animal. God forced him into being an animal. I'm just saying. Give me an explanation. But the choice to respond, God said he set up kings and takes down kings. And most of the kings that's been set up and taken down, it's been by force. You see what I'm saying? So I, I think this idea about God will never force your will, I think that needs to be reinvestigated and be fine-tuned. His spirit impresses our mind, convicts our hearts, and prompts us to do the right thing. But the choice to respond to the Holy Spirit appeal is always and only our own. I'm just saying, we need to reinvestigate this thing and the language we use. He respects, because if you say he respects our freedom, you're saying he respects our freedom to sin and he respects our freedom to do his will. I don't know how that fits with respects our sin. I, I don't see that concept anywhere in the Bible. I can call to mind. Uh, how does... Philippians 2, 12 through 14. How does this passage show the necessity of cooperating with God in our growth in grace? Now, let's unpack this. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 through 14. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God which worketh in you both to do and to will for his good pleasure. Okay. Now, how does this passage show the necessity of cooperating with God in our growth in grace? Now, how? let me ask this question first. How do we know that we're growing in grace? Now, remember how I defined grace early on? This is why this is so beautiful. Grace is that opportunity that God gives us to build up his kingdom. That's the opportunity. Now, you taking advantage of the opportunity is a whole nother issue. So while you're living, while you're breathing, you have an opportunity to build up God's kingdom. Okay? That's what grace is. I like to define everything in light of the kingdom. It makes things so much simpler, so much practical. So, uh, cooperating with God in our growth in grace. How do you know you're growing in grace? Because you're growing in strategic ways and in efficient ways of growing God's kingdom. Remember, grace is grace is that opportunity that God gives you to build up his kingdom, right? So growing in grace would have to be you, you actually building up his kingdom. And how do you know you're growing in his kingdom? Because you look back where you started from and how you were growing up, the grace to build up. And when I say build up a kingdom, I'm not just talking about literal things. I'm talking about both. Build it up in your heart, your mind. And when you're focused on constantly building up God's kingdom, guess what? You automatically going to get victory over sin. Why? Because your mind is infused with thoughts of building up the kingdom. Don't that sound practical, y'all? So, work out your own salvation. So, God offers you salvation. You know that. You accept the salvation. Now, how do you work, work out your salvation? You work out your salvation by working it out with God. How do you do that? By taking that grace, which is salvation, what does salvation do? It saves you from the world and it, and it saves you into an opportunity of grace to build up his kingdom in your heart, your mind, your relationship, the way that you handle finances, the way you stay out of debt, the way you become the head, the lender and the barber above and not beneath. You see what I'm saying? For multiple generations, building up your the kingdom in your family. How, you know how I know a lot of people not born again? 
I look at their families. It's real easy to see. It's just another family. No matter how nice or how unnice they are. So what does this mean by it is God that worketh in you? It's his power working in us. Let's go to Tuesday's lesson. Confidence and doubt. What was wrong with Peter's attitude before the cross? And Jesus said unto him, all ye shall be offended. He was self-confident. Why was he self-confident? Because the, the, as a nation, the Jews were self-confident. They really were self-confident. Peter was no match for the wiles of the evil one. He, he attempted to the face of Satan's temptation in his own strength. Filled with a sense of self-inflated confidence, he had little idea of the crisis that was coming. But you know one thing I like about Peter? His feet was headed towards the kingdom, even in this fault. God, give us the discernment to see the difference between Christians whose feet is headed to the kingdom, no matter what denomination they're in, and which Christians are not. These people are some wicked people, and some of them are nice, some of them mean, some of them whatever. Look at this. Both Peter and Thomas had one striking feature in common. They approached faith from a very human perspective. Peter placed confidence in what he could do. Thomas in what he could see. They depended upon on their faulty human judgment. But Pentecost made a difference. A transformed Peter fearlessly preached and 3,000 were baptized on Pentecost. Peter realized that his, he certainly had no strength to heal the, heal the lame man, but Jesus had the power and a miracle took place. When the authorities see all this healing that the disciples were doing, they were literally building up the kingdom of God with the miracles. All these faith healers, I don't see no kingdom getting built. All I see is them getting richer and more people getting debts and they actually paying loans. They paying tithe on debts, loans that they get. It's like crazy. Thomas was changed also. It, it is believed that he sailed to India to preach the gospel, though not much more is said about him. We can be sure that he had become a new man after Pentecost as well. Let's go to Wednesday's lessons. lesson. Conviction to return. What specific attitudes and actions led the prodigal to decide to return home? What principles of revival and reformation do What principles of revival and reformation do we see in these passages? I guess is it. I got something blocking my view. I can't see. Revival can be defined in different ways. However, it may be defined one factor ought. Yeah, I'm having trouble with my screen here. Bear with me, please. <clears throat> okay. The prodigal could not have both the pig pen and his father's banquet table. No, he couldn't. And that's that's what Christianity as we as is known today is offering. They're offering the pig pan and they're offering the father's banquet table at the marriage supper of the lamb. Simply put, the young man missed home too much to remain where he was. There was an aching in his heart to return. It is this heartache for the presence of God that leads us to long for revival and reformation. It is the heart's cry for the warm embrace of the father that motivates us to make necessary changes in our lives too. As the young man prepared to return home, he planned his apology in advance. He must have rehearsed it again and again. Read his speech in Luke 15, 8 
18 through 19 and his father's interpretation in verse 20 through 24. What does this interpretation reveal about the father's attitude towards his son and God's attitude towards us? So, although his son was far from his eyes, he was not far from his heart. The father's eyes reached the horizon of his son each day. The greatest motivation to make change in our lives is the desire to no longer break the heart of the one who loves us so much. You know what? One thing I feel about the prodigal son that I must bring out. Christian parents today, wow, it's, it's terrible. Christian parents, they let their children live any kind of way in their house. They don't, they don't have a hard, fast rule. Okay, if you want to do that, that means it's time for you to leave. Uh-uh. They could fornicate at home. They could watch porn at home. They could bring their girlfriend over and sleep over. I'm talking about Christians do this. They let the children drink. Bring stolen stuff to the house. Smoke dope at the house. And some parents even do it with them. And they Christians. Yeah, Adventists too. As the young man prepared his to return home, he planned his apology in advance. He must have rehearsed it again and again. Read his speech in Luke 15, 18 through 19, and his father's interpretation in verse 20 to 21. What does this interpretation reveal about the father's attitude toward his son and God's attitude towards us? Okay, I read all that. Reformation. How is this statement, my son was dead and is alive? We are not built. See, the son, this prodigal son, he took the money. He took time out of building up the kingdom, which is his father's house. And he went and rides his living. Christians are doing the same thing and pastors are encouraging riotous living. How do you know we have riotous living? Look at how much debt all Christians are in. Look at how much debt Christians get in. That's riotous. Accumulation of debt. We don't even believe we can live without debt. Just like the prodigal son didn't believe he could keep living while at his father's house living under the laws that govern his father's house or kingdom. So uh, let's go to Thursday's lesson. Jesus revealed the facts, re revealed the father's compassion and love. The miracle that he performed, he healed palsy bodies in order to reveal an even greater ability to heal palsy souls. He restored twisted arms and legs in order to demonstrate his great desire to restore twisted hearts and minds. Jesus' miracle teaches us something about how to exercise faith. They teach us valuable lessons about growth and change. One of Jesus' most powerful illustrations of the power of faith is found in the miracle of the sufferer at the pool of Bethesda. The poor man lay by the pool for 38 years. He was hopeless. His life seemed doomed and wretchedness to wretchedness. Why do you think Jesus asked the man, do you want to be made well? Is it rather obvious that Anyone suffering for so long would want to be healed? What was Jesus' motive here? What was the man's response? Jesus did not listen to the man's excuse. He did not counter the, to, counter the excuse with an argument. He simply said, rise, take up your bed and walk. The essential question, would this poor sick man believe the word of Christ and act upon it in spite of what he was experiencing? As soon as the man resolved the act upon, resolved the act upon, resolved to act upon the word of Christ, he was made whole. Now, this is a really good example of building up the kingdom in your body. Listen to Christ's words on how to take care of the body. Move on that word. If you believe the promise, believe that you are forgiven and cleansed. Jesus supplies. That fact, the fact, 
you are made whole just as Christ gave the paralytic power to walk when the man believed that he was healed. It is so if you believe it. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole, but say, I believe it. It is so, not because I feel it, but because God has promised. Why is it so important to believe God's promise of forgiveness, especially when we feel so condemned and guilty of our sins? Why must forgiveness precede reformation in our lives? Why is it important to believe that believe that we can't overcome through Christ's power in our lives even now? But anyway, let no, let's look at Fridays. Let no man present the idea that man is little or nothing to do in the great work of overcoming. For God does nothing for man without his cooperation. Neither say that after you have done all you can on your part, Jesus will help you. Help you. Christ has said, without me, ye can do nothing. If anything is going to happen, Jesus is going to take full control. Let no man present the idea that he must, man has little to, or nothing to do in the great work. Neither say that after you have done all you can on your part, Jesus will help you. Christ said, without me, you can do nothing. From first to last, man is to be labored together with God. Unless the Holy Spirit works upon the human heart and every step shall stumble and fall. Man's effort alone are, not, are nothing but a worthlessness, but cooperation with Christ means the victory. Never leave the impression on the mind that there is little or nothing to do on the part of man, but rather teach man to cooperate with God that he may be successful in overcoming. All true obedience comes from the heart. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he will so identify himself with our thoughts and aim, so blend his heart and mind with in conforming to his will that when obeying him, we shall but carry out our own impulses. The will refined and sanctified will find its high. Look at this, y'all. All true obedience. Obedience to what? The laws that govern God's kingdom. And the laws that govern God's kingdom is a written, is a transcript of his character. It was heart work with Christ. And if we consent, he was so identified himself with our thoughts. Why? Because we are submitting our mind. We yield in our mind. He will so identify himself with our thoughts and aims. So blend our hearts and minds into conforming to his will. What will? He said that you inherit the kingdom. That when obeying him, we shall be but carrying out our own impulses. The will refined and sanctified will find its highest delight in doing his service. What's his service? Building his kingdom, y'all. In our hearts, in our minds, in our relationships with our wives, in the way that we find a mate, in the way that we look for a mate. Through our appreciation of the character of Christ, through communion with God, sin will become hateful to us. What is sin? Sin is the transgression of the laws that govern God's kingdom. And those laws are a transcript of God's character. Well, this is Prophet 6, Family Prophets, the Angel of the Church to the Lay of the Sins. This is Lesson 10. God bless you. Please leave comments. Bye-bye.